today in the studio. He's back for a second time. Greg McHale. What's happening, Greg? Yeah, it's all it's great, Brad. Really appreciate you having me here. Uh, it's nice to get out of the snow, come down to Vegas and you know, visit with you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Hey, buddy, my pleasure. Anything to help you get out of the snow. Folks, if you guys <laughs> don't know who the guy is, at Greg McHale's Wild Yukon. You can find him on Instagram. You can also go to his website, Greg McHale's Wild Yukon.com. He's got a TV show on the Sportsman's Channel. He's like an outdoorsman, an elite outdoorsman with an extensive background in you know, athletics of some kind. I don't know. We'll get to what ones, but basically you are a all around outdoorsman. You have kayaking and you're a pilot. You can fly the little small planes and land on remote airstrips. You can bow hunt. You can, you know, shoot. You can do it all. Can you, can you kill a bear with a buck knife? That's uh, that's one thing I have not done is kill a bear with a buck knife. Thank goodness, because I probably wouldn't still be here. Wasn't it Dan Pena that? Wasn't it Dan Pena that said he killed a bear with a buck knife? I don't know. You know who Dan Pena is? I've heard the name, but I don't really know. I don't know who he is. And folks, he's also from Canada, eh? So he's from the Great White North, and mostly. You know, because there's no snow right here in this picture of you. So it's it's cold, though, no matter what. Yeah, it's cold. Generally speaking, like, I mean, it was, you know, we've had minus 40 so far this this winter. Which and you're is, up there hunting in that weather. Yeah. In the springtime, which is March for us. Um, yeah, it gets cold. And in the wintertime, typically you're hunting bison. But what about summer? Summertime. Yeah. 27 degrees would be a super hot day Celsius. Wow. So what's that? Just, you know, 80, 80. Just so it gets, 80. it gets warm up there in the summer. Yeah, it, uh, well, we have long daylight, right? So we've got almost, you know, just 20 hours of daylight almost. So it, it does get warm for sure, but it doesn't get hot. Do you, do you hunt in the summer? Yeah. Most of the hunting is done from August through October. So, so after that, no hunting? Pretty much it shuts down in the, like there, you can almost hunt something in the Yukon all year round. There's like a period between, I think, April and June or something that really not much is over. What do you do when there's nothing going on? Well, we, you know, the whole hunting thing is just one part of one business that we have. I have a major, tour, like a tourism business that, um, we, you know, see that 70,000 visitors in the summer. So, that's that's part of it. it has some real estate and we're kind of hiking and whatnot. No, it's uh it's caters to the cruise ship traffic. Um, so we're actually rebranding it, but it's been known as Caribou Crossing Trading Post, which will now be a Wild Adventure Yukon. Uh, we're going through a rebranding phase right now, and pretty excited about that. But yeah, that caters to the cruise ship traffic. So if you know, I think that uh, a lot of Americans have Alaska on their bucket list. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you jump on the cruise ship and head to Skagway, Alaska and get on, uh, we're one of the excursions, you head over into Canada and we have kind of like an amusement park type thing, probably four or five different businesses in one, dog cart rides and all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. So how did you end up with a TV show? Well, hunting's always been part of my life since I was, you know, a small child, grew up with hunting, Mom. You know, fishing, I just spent a lot of time fishing with my father and I had a lot of fishing holidays from school, which was, which was pretty great. So, Fly fishing? Um, not, not so much ice fishing, more, I grew up in uh, two hours from Toronto. So it's, you know, pretty, I suppose, far removed from where I live now and still be in the same country. So yeah, it was kind of just, it's always been part of my life. And I moved post university out to, to the Yukon and just search of wild places in search of you know, who, who am I as a, as a young man? And what do I, what do I want in life? And I knew that I was drawn to adventure and drawn to the mountains, which certainly didn't have any of that in Ontario. So I had to, uh, had to seek it out and landed, found my, found my way into the Yukon. And I remember telling my girlfriend at the time and my wife now, I remember telling our parents, we were just going to Alberta, which was, you know, manageable for them. And all the time we knew we were heading to the Yukon, but we knew that if we, you know, we told them that there was going to be, you know, you're not, you're not taking your girlfriend's car. It's not allowed to go type thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, 
I was just drawn to drawn to the the most wild place that I could possibly imagine, and that was the Yukon. And right away, I got a job as as a as a hunt hunting packer. So, you know, a lot of guys. You, that were would, you guys broke? Oh yeah, like just you and your girl. Yeah, at I least did. you brought a girl up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those nights get cold. You, you might want to bring it, bring them with you. This is one of the uh, <laughs> one of the sayings. They don't need to go, live that far north. Yeah. Well, she must have liked you a lot in order to do that. Well, um, yeah. Most women I, don't I, want to head up to the Yukon. No, when I when I mentioned to her, let's let's go to the Yukon. Literally, she said, I, "Like, are you are you kidding me? Like, where's the Yukon? Like, even in Canada, it's it's so far out there." Um, but you know, we did our research. You have a big, beautiful home up there. I've got a nice place. Did you build it? Uh, no, we we bought it. I have have built. I did build a huge log home out there, and uh, but our main business is too far from it. Once we bought that business, so we moved closer, and yeah, bought another house. Is she happy? Um, I believe that she is very happy. Like if you said. Honey, let's go back to Ontario. She'd oh. say, "Hell no!" Oh, there would be there is there's no chance. So she's not leaving the no. Yukon. No, I'll be damned. We will leave the Yukon. Um, event like I wouldn't say that uh, that when our kids are grown up, um, I could easily see living, you know, six months somewhere else. But certainly, summer times heading back heading to the Yukon. How uh, how many kids do you have? Two. So and and they don't hunt with you. Well, I, um. I've had some, yeah, some amazing experiences. My son is now 10, um, daughter is seven. When my son was seven, he came on his first hunting trip with my father and I. And my father is 76, and we went on a sheep hunt, which is considered the, you know, arguably the most difficult hunt in North America physically. Now, now why? Because you got to traipse up mountains? Yeah, just climbing mountains, and you have to carry everything on your back. Why? And why do that? Why do you have to carry everything on your back? Well, the the animals are just in remote places. You, you ever heard of a pack mule? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can take horses, but where I go and you know, I try to get off the beaten path and where nobody else goes, and that's why I have airplanes, and they allow me to access really remote country. And then once you park that airplane, then uh, it's all you know, it's all up to you. What's the scariest moment ever in your hunting career? There's uh there's two that are really close. I had a grizzly bear experience um when uh, when I was bow hunting. That's so, not a good time to have a bear encounter when you have a bow. It, yeah, it's I'd want a big ass <laughs> gun at that point in time. Do you carry guns even when you're bow hunting? Uh generally speaking no because what we're doing is everything is backpack hunting. Yeah, but dude, you're in the Yukon. Yeah. That's the wilderness. But the wilderness is my is my happy place. Yeah, it's, that's what they said with that guy that played with the bears until they ate him. Yeah, well, that guy didn't even have a gun, from what I understand. Well, that's not, well neither did you. You have a bow. That ain't the same thing. The bow's not going to stop a big-ass bear. Yeah, but I'm also not going out there actively wanting to, you know, be this far away from a grizzly bear that's... You know, Who I, was that guy? There's a story about him, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know what his name is, but he was a pretty eccentric dude that was really trying to be intimate with these bears and be part of their their family almost and spend months in areas where heavily heavily bear populated right and that just eventually you do that and it's probably going to go south on you 100 percent. but I, I wouldn't be out i wouldn't be caught in the wilderness without a gun yeah on my body yeah and i think that for the most part um you know, we have a gun with us, but I have, you know, when I've been backpack hunting alone, this is pre-television show, I'm not going to carry a gun and a bow. Um, it's just, you know, it's just too much weight. Okay. So dang. So you get, you get technical then you got, you, you're doing some serious outdoorsman shit. If you're worried about weight, another 10 pounds. Yeah. Well, lot, most of our hunts are like this, this hunt that you did last, you know, this past year, year, um, 20, well, it was about a 20, 16 mile hike from the airplane to the base of the mountain, you know, over top of mountains and through bush and mud, up, like up to your knees. And it's like, you know, it's, it's 
not everybody a 75 pound pack on your back like you're gonna ounces count no and now you got to come out once you once you get something and he goes with you yeah yeah carl's with he carl's with me all the time so you must be conditioned as well <laughs> absolutely you guys got good cardio well my back uh, my background is cardio like i've did like that's what adventure racing well, is. Well, people are going to get pissed because I interrupted the scariest story. So the grizzly, <laughs> to go back to the grizzly. So so everyone is just, dude, he's telling about the grizzly and you interrupt him with some stupid shit. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, I was bow hunting by myself, uh, packed in and walking down a game trail and crossed a creek, came up over the creek under a rise and I looked to my right and I could like, the hair stands up in the back of your neck and you know, like there's a, there's a grizzly bear right there. So I see it's, but this bear is 23 yards from me and it's sleeping and it's sleeping just behind this mound. And what it had done is it had killed a moose and it, what they do is they bury them. So they'll eat, eat as much as they can and then they'll bury them and then they'll come back to them, you know, later. Well, it was just fat and happy and sleeping right beside this, this moose. So, and obviously when you're bow hunting, you're, you know, you're moving through the, through the wildernesses, you know, quietly. And I was calling, calling moose. And then I moved, moved on. And that's how this happened is I was just moving quietly on a game trail, which was, you know, quiet. And I happened to get that close and, I've been had a lot of bear encounters, but never was able to walk up onto a bear like that unless I was actively trying to pursue it. Um, so that was surprising to to me to be that close. And I'm like, I'm I'm I've got my don't have an arrow out, so I just have my bow in my hand, and this is a problem because obviously if this thing you know wakes up it's going to protect that with, you know, every that's, that's, it's, that's, it's food for the winter type thing. We're in the fall, the winter is coming and these bears are trying to actively get as much food in them as possible and are not going to be happy with somebody. Uh, they would obviously assume that I'm coming to take their, take their dinner. Right now, if it did wake up, would you be dead? Well, this, it did wake up. So here's, here's what happened is, now I'm 23 yards from this bear. Its body is laying straight away from me. And I know that- Is it a big one? Yeah, it's all I can see really is its body and the size of its head. And its head is, its head is, is it's a big interior grizzly bear. So I don't know how big it is at this when point you, because- Oh, you're using terms that are unfamiliar. Okay. Interior. Yeah, so mountain grizzly, there's, and Alaskan grizzly, a coastal grizzly, they're just a different, um, they're just a different category of bear. But they're all big and they're all brown and they kill you if they, you know. Well, a grizzly bear. It's a grizzly bear. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to mess with a grizzly so, bear. So at this point, I can't tell how big it is. It looks big, but I mean, I'm 23 yards from it and, and I'm trying to figure out to myself, okay, Greg, are we going to try to, get, you know, to kill this bear while it's laying there to shoot it while it's laying there or do i try to get out of here because i don't have a good shot no matter what and because all i can see is its head basically and its chest rising and uh beyond that so i don't have a vital shot mm. uh and i know this so first off i have to put an arrow in my on my bow and then that's the, that's the first thing I, and I got to do it without waking this bear up. So, cause every little movement is, I, I can't believe I got this close in the first place. Now every little movement is a potential to, to wake this bear up. And then I know I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a completely different world. Are bears easily woken up? Well, I, I this is the first experience I've had with a sleeping bear. So at this point, I don't, I don't really know. And I've never had another one since, uh, because I wouldn't actively go and look for it <laughs> again with this, you know, knowing what I know, but now, now where was I'm, Carl? No, I was by myself. Oh, hunting. Okay. Where was Carl? Probably down in Victoria. Like <laughs> I didn't know Carl at that point. 
All right. Um, so yeah, this bear is sleeping. I'm going to put an arrow and knock an arrow on my bow. And then I'm going to decide from, from here. So I find, I get an arrow in and my feet are, if you've ever bow hunted, it's really difficult to pull, pull a, a heavy compound bow back without having a solid base. So my feet are right beside each other and now, and I have to move and I don't want to take my eyes off this bear. So I look, I'm kind of looking down. I've got my arrow knocked. I'm in a position that I can, I can shoot it or I want to get into a position that I can shoot it if I have to, or I can back up and get out of here. But at least I have an arrow that if it wakes up, at least I can pull back and I can try to defend myself somewhat. So as I'm got my arrow knocked, I'm watching the bear. I need to get my feet further apart so I can get a good base so I could pull it back. I look back behind me. Um, I go to take a step backwards and I step in this moss. And as I do underneath the moss, there is a, there is a branch. I snap this branch and as like, it was so fast. It was unbelievably fast. He heard that and he got up so quickly and he cl closed the distance 13 yards to like in a fraction of a second. So to answer the question, are they easily woke up? Absolutely. And, and that's why I, to this day, I don't, I can't imagine how I even got there without him hearing me when that's what it took to wake him up. He takes two jumps poof, poof, and he's standing on top of this, on top of the moose, looking straight at me, like maybe twice the distance from me to you. We're about five yards here, six yards. He's 12 yards away, standing on top of the moose, looking at me with it and snapping his jaws. So I just immediately pull back. I look, the only vital area is like right here and his shoulder blades are both right here. So I just pull back instinctively, put a 20 yard pin on him because that's the least I've got. He's closer than that and I let go. And that arrow comes up and it just smashes him and, and hits him in the shoulder. He roars, he looks at, he looks down at the arrow and he goes to, and it's sticking out of him like this far. And he goes to seize the arrow, he goes to swipe at it. And as he does, he moves his other leg back and, and he misses it. And then, so he's hit and then he, and then he spins and I go to the ground. Like I go to the ground cause all I'm thinking is I need another arrow. So I don't even see what's going on. And I'm behind this little mound of just a little buck brush, little mound. And I'm like quivering, cowering behind. And I'm trying to get an arrow out really fast. And I get it knocked because I think that this bear is going to like, he's not make basically means like a gun would be cocked. An arrow is knocked. Right. So why, why knocked? Because the, the little shaft on the end of the arrow is called a knock. And that knock goes into the string. Gotcha. So you knock the arrow. So I get the arrow knocked and I'm just waiting for this bear to be on top of me. And all I can hear, and that was back in the days when we were using aluminum arrows. Now I use carbon shafts. And I could hear that um, off, to, off to my left. I could hear the bear, <clears throat> the arrow shaft going off of the bushes. So I could hear tink, tink, tink. And then he went up this hill and just stopped up there and sitting down and looking at me and huffing. And that's when I was like, I got to get like, I mean, I am out of here. And he, he didn't come down the hill. He just looked at me and then eventually he walked, he walked off and I walked the other way. You think the arrow bled him out eventually? No. Cause what I did is I came back. Um, I came back two days later. It took me a day over a day to hike back out and then uh, to go and get a gun. And I came back in two days later and he had taken that moose and he had dragged it a hundred meters back further into the bush and he buried it again. So like, you I mean, the I, first burial I, was, it's he, almost like a treasure. Right. Right. So he was like, okay, I got to get this. And then, and then I found my arrow. Um, 
and it was like like the the arrow was fully intact. So I mean, he it just it hit bone, and then it it basically popped out. Mm. So that's the absolute scariest. Never got, almost got lost or 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 like avalanche or anything crazy, crazy. So yeah, I guess the other one would happened. Yeah, not long ago, a few years ago on a on a goat hunt, I was. You know, we um, are goats real dangerous to get near. Well, they live in some they live in some pretty rough country, like vertical, you know, rocks and just tough country. And they're just they're amazing animals and where they can live and what they can move through. So we had uh, we had hunted for about I don't know three or four days, and we got on this billy and um, in some just remote and beautiful country and hiking back out. And I was leading the way and there was three of us and we're hiking out with a goat on our back, heading back to the airplane and come, I've been spent so much time in the mountains. You just kind of know when, when you're in a bad spot. So we were coming down this rock chute and I just kind of, the hair stood up on the back of my neck because of the, the stability of the rocks. And it just didn't feel, I knew it didn't feel right, but I would, I didn't want to get out of the, the chute because if I got out of the chute, I would have had to go into alders and then it would be just like fighting your way down the mountain. So this was the cleanest and easiest route, um, not the safest. So I, um, I'm leading the way and the guys are behind me and uh, a few rocks moved around a little bit, but I stayed in and I started walking between these two boulders on, on the side. There was a bit of a, you know, kind of a bit of a shoot through them. And as I get through, through them, the ground starts to move. So the rocks start to move and right, you know, right then I'm like, this, this is bad. Cause we're talking, we're not talking like shale here. We're not talking small rocks. We're talking rocks the size of this desk and the size of your desk, which is much bigger than this one. Um, and at the, so I started <clears throat> right away, I lost my footing. You know, I've got a goat in my back and the pack's probably 90 pounds. And it's not like you're agile and you can just, you know, rock hop and get out of the way quickly. So I lost my footing and went down onto my back. Um, and cause all the rocks just started moving. And Are now like I'm, an in, avalanche or I'm in an avalanche of rocks, of Damn. boulders. And See, why are you up in the Yukon, bro? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Like, what the hell are you choosing that for? You're, you're up there purposefully. I think that it's, you know, it's the choice of adventure. It's the choice of the unknown and being in these places where you can't control everything. And that's the, that's the thing that I love the most is not knowing the outcome every day. And that's, I think the, you know, I can get into that, but that's kind of my philosophy is you must chase adversity because in that adversity is where all of the glory is and where you find yourself and find what you're made of. So like it's, that's what I live for. It's a living for the adventure, living for, and I, not that I want to put myself in those, I'm actively searching those, you know, death situations, but knowing and putting yourself in a place that you don't know what you're going to get. And that's what na the beautiful thing about the natural environment. And we don't live in that world so much anymore. Where it's all controlled. But when you seek it and you experience these these, ex these things that only those places can give you. You come out of it with an appreciation for life and a drive to want to be better and to want to do more and to, and those things translate to business and everyday life. Um, and when it's, it's such a great feeling. So when you pack an animal out, where are you packing it to your well, vehicle? Yeah, gen like depending on what mode of transportation that we're using to get in there, often you know I have I fly, so one of uh, you know pack it, you pack it out to the plane, pack it out to the plane, and then, then fly out. Yeah. Then where do you fly to? Fly home, like to Whitehorse. 
is White Horse Yukon. Canada. Yeah. Is it called White Horse Yukon? Yeah. Is U- Yukon would be considered what in Canada? An area? A or territory, a province. Ter- a province. Oh, it's yeah. a province, like it's, Quebec. It's, yeah. I'll be damned. What's the biggest town in the Yukon? White Horse is the biggest. What and the, what we call, yeah, you're right. You're more referenced as a town because the population might be 35,000 people. And the whole population of the Yukon might be forty to forty five thousand. So So you so you like to you like creature comforts after all. Oh absolutely. Okay, because yeah. when you were first talking, I thought you were way out in the middle of the boondocks. No, no, we no no. A uh I, I mean, I love coming to to Vegas to you know, it's a lot of people watching and so <laughs> it's it's a it's a different if it's it's a different place. Um and I think, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, it's the diversity and having multiple, like being able to blend into different, different places, I think is, uh, is, is pretty, pretty unique. And I think it's pretty neat. And I can live in the wilderness. Like I know right now that if I, if the world was all going, going dark, I can take my family and jump into an airplane and live in the wilderness just fine. And at the same time, I could jump in the airplane and fly down to Vegas and, you know, have a great time down here and and do the same. So, well, I think I could take my family into the wilderness and survive as well. Not ice ass cold wilderness, but wilderness. Yeah. Like as long as it's summer out, (laughs) we're (laughs) we're just up in the woods and I have the right equipment. Yeah. No problemo. Do you think, do you think that would be difficult for somebody? I think it would, I think it would be almost impossible. Quiz me, quiz me on like what I would do. No, I'm not, I'm not saying it would be impossible for you, but if we're talking the, the average person. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking, cause I'm thinking of the Pacific Northwest. I'm not thinking yeah. snowy 50 below bears and you know, all the crap you got to deal with. But if I was up in the mountains that I grew up in, you know, we, as kids just go climbing around the mountains and you know, there were deer. I, I, we never saw anything dangerous. Yeah. Um, if I had a weapon, a weapon and a fishing pole and some sleeping bags and some camping gear, I could be gone. No problem and survive, go fishing, hunting, kill rabbit, eat, start fires. What would be the first thing that you would do? Set up a camp. What would a camp look like in, in the, the Pacific Northwest for your family? Well, I'd find uh, hopefully some sort of uh, shelter made out of earth, ideally. If I could find like a cave, that'd be better. But I would just find some sort of shelter. Why? Well, because you guys, you have to have a home base, right? See, see, Brad, most people wouldn't even have a remote answer to that question. And this, this is the difference, is that the way the world is right now and the comforts that people just assume are their are are their right and what would you do? Well, yeah, the first the first place the first thing it's family, right? Family first. It's shelter. You need to find See? shelter Bango. for your family. Look at that, Carl. I need my own show right now. Bring Dude, it. That's what that's another show that you guys can because you're good at what you do. You're not afraid of that shit. Get some freaking city slicker out in the Yukon. That would be a freaking show. That would be a show, but uh, yeah. And all you're there It'd is- be a train wreck. Well, all you're there is to bail them out of the trouble. Yeah. Because dude, you're, you're, you've you been up there for years and years and years. You're like a outdoor, elite outdoorsman. You can kayak, river raft. You're like Bear Grylls, right? You, you know who Bear Grylls is? I, I know who he is. I don't think I Bear Grylls philosophy on uh, on what a what a television show is and, and what mine is very different. Well, I th- I, I heard his was a little a, a whole lot set up. Meaning, well, well meaning. I heard that too, and I I I think I've watched one episode, and I used to ice climb and like mountaineering was was my gig, um, big wall climbing. And I watched him on one episode where he threw a uh, a rope, an ice axe with a rope across a canyon. And he was with some celebrity, I think, you know, the 90210 girl or something, one of those, um, across a canyon 
And he, you know, kind of tugged on it a couple times and said, yeah, we're good to go. And, you know, and he repelled or not. He uh, didn't have to repel, but he kind of hand over hand across this uh, traversed Tyrolean traverse across this rope that he just threw this ax into the turf on the other side. I'm like, okay. Stupid. Stupid. Yeah. Not even possible. Yeah. That's what I mean. I saw something. I forget where he's like, you know, he, this isn't a good thing to do, but we have to go down here to make it. And he's like traipsing down this crack of a canyon to get to the bottom of the canyon. Yeah. And like, you can see that like you could easily go around this way and, and there's like a steep grade, but still a grade. You could have just slid yeah. your butt down. Why would you have to do that whole thing? Yeah. So it's for, it's, I don't trust Bear Grylls it's, it's show. made up for TV, right? Well, dude, there's a lot of value in um, showing people how to survive. Absolutely. But it has to be real. Yeah, and there's a lot of great survival schools out there. What do you think the best survival school is? The, the, I don't know. I Why don't you start one? <laughs> I don't know if there's enough money in survival schools. Well, it depends on who you're teaching. Yeah, true. If you if you had, you know, some some let's call them bug out places all dialed in in the Yukon and you let a lot of very wealthy individuals realize that if the world takes a shit like it might, you know, the planes leaving at this time, it's almost like an escape yeah. policy. Yeah, right. What's your escape plan? Well, get your private jet, get in it, get up to the Yukon and then we'll jump in, you know, my small plane and we'll shuttle out there and this is uh this is where we survive, right? What if the shit hits the fan and you had to go to the Yukon and live? Would you? If I had to go to the Yukon and live? Not if you had to. I mean, let's let's say shit was getting I, thick. I mean, I'm in the right spot. Yeah, you're well. You're already in the right spot. I'm already in the right. Who spot. else is even going to Whitefish or whatever it's called? What's it called? <laughs> White Claw. White Horse. White Horse. Yeah. How long does it take to get to White Horse? From here, while well, we're whatever it takes to get to Vancouver from here, and then we're two and a half hour flight from there, north, straight north. In a jet or in a, a jet? And then you land. Is White Does White Horse have a airport? Yep. Oh yeah, we have an international airport. Wow. We so have direct like, flights from, from Germany in the summer. Well, then, dude, you're probably going to get a bunch of people from the bomb squad wanting to go up there and hang out and fish and hunt, hunt and fish and camp with you. Right on. Let's do you, go. Do you do that? No, like, no, I don't. Like, I don't take people out. But but I don't know why you wouldn't if you have a show. Do people pay big dollars to go out with you? Yeah. Well, let's... Uh, and it'd be part of the show. Put the business to plan together and <laughs> let's go. Well, dude, I guarantee you, listen, if you want to make an offer tell a bomb squad listener to submit their name or something, go to your Instagram and DM you bomb squad. Love to go hunting. And I'll bet you thousands of dollars that you will get hundreds, if not thousands of people saying I will come up there and go hunting and not for free. They'll pay you. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing about hunting is I can't just take anybody out. I don't, you know, I don't own an outfit. So I do the hunting because I'm a resident for me. So yeah, it's not a matter of like, could, could they come hunting with me? Well, you'd have no, to be, if, in, I, if I flew up there, you'd say you could take me hunting. Couldn't you? Yeah. You're different. What's that? What do you mean? Like I, <clears throat> for the short time I've known you, it's, it's about, it's about for me, I want to be in the Hills. I call them Hills. I want to be in the mountains with people that I want to be in the mountains with. Like I don't just go out and hunt with somebody that um, just calls me up and says, Hey, I'd love to, I get, Hey Greg, so I won't kill me one of them sheep. Right. Like, I mean, I want to hunt with people that are like-minded that are motivated, driven, and that want to have, you know, have an experience to take in the whole experience, not just to go and kill something. And I'm, and really for me, it's about, that's why I that's why I hunt with the people that I hunt with is the team is super small and I get you know it's it's Carl like the team is small and we go hard and we push ourselves physically mentally in challenging places and I hunt with my family now my son and um, when my daughter's old enough I'll take her my father and his what's old enough um, she's she's getting there she's uh, she's seven now. 
Um, so I think that next year she can. She you can let hunt. them handle weapons? No, legally they they handle weapons, but they can't hunt in, in the Yukon until they're 12 years old. Mm. So that's like my son, you know, he carries, yeah, at seven years old, he was carrying a hind quarter of a sheep and, you know, off the mountain, he last or two years ago there, he's carrying my, my father's sheep horns off the mountain. This is, there was that one sheep horn that you go on, you, that you have on your Instagram. Those a that's a big ass head. Like how big are those sheep up there? Well, we have, um, yeah, we have, there's some big rams, but, uh, I search and do a lot of, a lot of work to find. I personally, what are those horns worth real quick? Well, for you to come up, if you had to buy it through an outfitter, um, to go on a 10 day sheep hunt, it would cost, I don't know, 35 grand. No, like if I went to your page again and I saw, I'll show you what I'm talking about. This, I think it's right there. No, that ain't it. The, uh, a big ass sheep head. If you said here, Brad, you can have this sheep head. What, what, uh, where'd it go? You know the one I'm talking about on, yeah. your, on your Instagram? Yeah, there's it, a few it, on it there. It was a big ass sheep head. How much would that, like if you gave that to me, those horns, what would they be worth? There's, it's pretty difficult to put a, to put a value on it because the value is in, as ultimately it's in the, the experience. Now this one it looks like you're just petting it. Is that dead? That's a, that's a goat. <laughs> yeah, it's dead. Well, why is it sitting up like it's not? You know, you can you can place them in a, in a way that their body will sit up. That looks like literally it's pet. Yeah, you can see my hand. I'm kind of holding it. I'm I'm holding it up for the photo. In in that one, <laughs> yeah, not a pet. Actually, I think that that literally that's the one the the goat that um, I got caught in the rock slide coming off the mountain. Yeah, dude, looking at these pictures. Everybody go look at these pictures. I guarantee you, you get a bunch of people. Those horns, I think. Those are big-ass horns right there. Yeah. So, like, you would think horns are worth money. Because where do you get them? Well, well you got to go up and get them. But, but that is that is just it. So somebody pays $35,000, say, to go on a hunt in the, in the Yukon, or and they take those horns back and they take those horns back with an experience. They're never going to sell them because it's the experience. Yeah, but you would, you'd give them away. You'd probably give them a ton away. You don't care. You can go grab them anytime you want. No, no, every, every, no, it's they like mean, a, they do mean a lot to me. Now I don't, I don't mount, I don't mount a lot of animals um, because it's not about, it's not about that for me. It's about the whole experience of the hunt. Like I was referencing hunting with, with my family and being able to take your seven-year-old son and your 76-year-old father on a hunt and watch those two people um, suffer in their own way but differently and to watch my father try to make his way through the mountains and have and me having to carry his gear and help him up the mountain and watching my son, you know, trying to bust his way through willow that is so far over his head and you know and watch watch that little guy do it with his with the tenacity and his head down and we're just going to we're part of the group we're part of the experience now to now to come out of that successful and watch my dad carry his sheep horns off of the mountain um, and my son carry, you know, meat off of the mountain that we're going to take home. Like those, those sheep horns, there is no money on the planet that you could give me. How, explain how you get the horns to where like you could put them on your wall. Do you know how to do all that? Uh, like, I mean, you have to take the cape, like they, like, do I like boil it? And no, all this? I, I don't do any of that. It's just too time. But you can you field dress animals. Oh yeah. So like, what's the procedure? Walk someone through it. So like, let's say right now someone's out in the wilderness. They killed a deer. Just keep it simple. Okay, just a deer. They're like, dude, we got. I got to eat this for my family. But they've never hunted and they don't know what to do. They just shot it. It's dead. It's laying there. What do you do? What's Oof. the first thing you do? Well, the first thing you do is um, you take the what they call the cape, which is the, the skin. 
you take the hide and you you pull the hide back and you gut the animal. So gutting yeah, the animal. Yeah, but again, I mean, like, how do you pull the hide back? Okay. Well, you take your knife and you start at the abdomen and you cut cut the animal up to, you know, if you don't want to keep the, if you don't need to keep the hide, then, you know, you just cut it up all the way to the, to the neck and then you slowly peel it back. And the whole point is to save as much meat as you possibly can. So you don't want to get the meat dirty. So you want to try to get the animal into a flat spot. There's not a whole lot of, you know, brush and you leave the cape and, under it. Yep. As you drag it to wherever, you know, you move it wherever you need to, to, cause the whole point here is to come out of the hills or out of the mountains with as much meat as you possibly can. A little barbaric, isn't it? Well, it's a little, it's a little kind of where we came from. <laughs> You know, that's, that's the, that's the problem <sighs> is that we forget where we've come from. And when we forget where we come from and we think that, you know, a 30 year old dude sitting in his basement playing video games all day with his VR goggles on talking to his girlfriend, you know, that he doesn't even know as a girl, 6,000 miles on the other side of the planet. That is not where we came. <laughs> That's not, that's not my idea of what I want to instill in my kids. I want to, I want them to look back and go, this is where we came from. This is why our meat is sitting in the freezer at home. Do you have a lot of meat in the freezer? Yeah. I also sp supply a lot of meat for a lot of other families and some families that can't even afford meat. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of reward when I, you know, single moms last year, we, we took two moose on one trip um, and that meat all went to single moms who they then took that meat and they processed it themselves. And they, you know, they put it into bags and filled their freezers for their family, right? So these are the kind of things that hunting provides. And yes, is it, can it be considered barbaric? Some, some may say so, but I don't think, it's barbaric when you're you're getting back to what humans where we came from. Well, I was saying that for our earlier conversation in the green room. The listeners won't know, but I told you that story where I stopped hunting because I literally slaughtered an animal, and I thought it was yeah. so barbaric that I quit doing it. And that that was I think that you know I had a little bit of time to think about that, and that's a unique experience that even I've never had. Now, the, I think that the person that you were out with um, didn't know what, you know, shouldn't have been, shouldn't necessarily have been the, the one that you was trying to, that was trying to teach you. Well, I mean, dude, this was beyond teaching. My dad taught me to hunt. My okay. uncles, I mean, my whole family hunts. Nice. You so, know, you know. As a little kid, I was walking around the mountains right. hunting. But, but, you know, usually I didn't just sit there and watch, but I, I feel dressed a deer before. Yeah. You know, I know how to do what you're saying, but I don't remember doing anything with a cape. I remember slicing them up the middle and yeah. hanging them upside down. So all the blood drains out first. Okay. Well, how did you get them to a place where you could hang them upside down? You just tie their feet and throw them over a tree and pull it up. That's like out, right out in the field. You did that. Yeah. There were trees where I was at. Yeah, well, I'm generally speaking, I'm in the I'm in the mountains, and when there is trees, it's a moose, and you're certainly not pulling, you know, throwing a rope over top of a tree and yarding. Yeah, and you're like a in moose the tundra. Out. You're yeah. like in the in the tundra. Yeah. No, like there's trees, man. You just throw a rope over a tree. But branch. I don't know that. But that's it's not necessary. Well, I again, I can't remember. It was a long time ago. But my point was, is by the time I slaughtered the animal, I was like probably 16, 17. You know, we were just out dicking around. We weren't hunting per se, but I lived in the Pacific Northwest where like, you know, you just drive a little bit outside of town. There's deer and shit yeah. going on. So of course, you know, we all had guns, you know, that's just normal, like on our gun rack in our vehicles. Yeah. Remember gun racks? Do you have one now? No, we, we can't. I haven't seen a gun rack in a long time. It's because they're all illegal now. Oh, they are? Yeah. Why? Because you can't have, like in Canada, you certainly can't have a a a gun to the open public. You know, if you park your truck and you go in and uh, 
I don't know, grab a beer in the pub with the boys and somebody breaks in and sees your gun and goes and grabs it. Well, now there's a, hmm. you know, I think well, that that's probably the reason. Well, back when I was driving around 16, 17 years old, dude, you could have a gun rack in, yeah. in your truck and have two guns up there. So we were driving around, boom, we figure, Hey, let's go shoot something. And remember, I wasn't like, you know, I feel bad for animals. I'd shoot animals. I'd shoot them all the time. But this particular one was trying to get a little drink of a water right? Just getting a little drink of water. And I saw it. And sure enough, you know, you get, you know, that, that feeling you get when you see one, it's like, Oh shit. The, the adrenaline. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> my heart starts thumping and I pull it out and I scope him up and bang and it drops him, but it didn't die. Cause it started going eh, and it started like screaming or I didn't know a deer made a sound, but it did like a, almost like a sheep. So I walk up to it and it's, I was looking at me scared shitless. I could feel the fear that this animal had. And it was at first the eye looked fearful, but, but sad. Like, why the hell did you do that? And then, then I got me sad and I'm like, well, damn dude, I got to put, put him out of his misery now. So I put the gun to his head to pull the trigger and I looked away so I didn't get blood splattered on me because I figured it's going to splatter, right? It's right. I'm getting so close to it. I was literally this far away from its face. Or is it that you actually didn't want to see it? Either one. Mm -hmm. But I went like this. I turned my head. And when I turned my head, I must have moved the gun a little tiny bit and I shot and I pulled the trigger and I look and I hear louder screaming. And then I look back and I had shot the jaw off the deer and now it's now it's eyes were even more scared looking it was whining at the top of its lungs i felt like a asshole i'm like dude we are rude we are this is barbaric and then my friend scott had a buck knife and just stuck it in the it were, like where the nuts were and slid it up and guts poured out and it finally obviously stopped screaming but so he killed it for good and then proceeded to just take the back straps like he, he was just like and he was like filleting the damn thing mm-hmm. and he left a big old pile heaping steaming carcass of animal there and took like pretty much the back straps anything that's valuable on a deer that's what he took and that's it yeah everything else he just left there in a big heap and i'm and i said dude i'm never ever hunting again like that was just rude it was just trying to get a damn water yeah. You know, what if it had family around here? And I started being all dramatic and shit. And I thought, yeah. dude, this is a terrible. This is, I'm never doing it. And I've never hunted again. Not that I wouldn't, I'd feed my family. I'd do it again. I'd kill an animal to eat, but I don't, I don't, I don't really need to eat. You know, I go to the grocery store and someone else did the hunting. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, I would like to believe that that's a unique experience um, that you had. And that would be traumatic. Like, I mean, there is no, not a time that I kill an animal and that I don't feel like feel, I don't know for remorse. I don't like killing animals. Like it's, I, I don't get the, the pleasure of the kill. There is zero pleasure of the kill. It's the experience and the, the meat. And I don't need to kill animals to, you know, I can afford to go to the grocery store and buy all the meat, you know, that I need as well. But that's why hunting, when you actively, like you guys just rolled out of the truck and just blasted a deer. Like that's not hunting. That the experience that you just, that you, that you just. That's murdering. It's, that's murdering. <laughs> yeah, we like, went murdering. Right? Um, that's Hey, not, by the way, allegedly in case the statute of limitations or, or, or they never, you know, run out because I don't know who knows. It's yeah. Allegedly that happened. Yeah, that's not, that's not hunting. And I think it's important for those of us that are ethical and and true hunters get out to the, to the public because hunters are conservationists. Number one, we love animals. Like I, like when I look at a a doll sheep on the mountain or I'm flying in my airplane and I see, you know, a, a group of sheep or moose down in the Valley, it's like, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And yes, do I actively pursue them to kill them? Yes. And people don't like that. 
They don't. Well, not uh, there's a bunch. Some of people, people don't like. Some people don't like that. But if you eat any form of meat, then you should just shut your mouth shut your pie and hole. not even have uh, an opinion on hunting. That's right. Um, and I don't, by the way, FYI. Like again, I'm I, I I almost want to go hunting again. It's been years, but it's also a lot of work. Like, dude, packing that animal out of that mountain, like you got to be in serious condition. You got to be really, really uh, interested in doing it. Like, if you said, Brad, I'll take you hunting. Come to come to Alaska. I don't know, man. I'd have to think through it. Not because of the hunting, because I don't want to kill an animal. Yeah. It's because of the work. Like, right. And especially now that I'm learning more about you, you, yeah. you seem to get off on the work part of it. Well, I think that, see, that's very interesting that you say that, um, that, that the work is, is the problem because, um, I don't believe you. <laughs> and, and the reason I don't believe you is because you don't, you don't build this. You don't, I know that you've transformed your body, uh, over the years. Like, you know what work is. And as much as you say it's fun and you, it was, wasn't that much work, um, I think that that it comes naturally to you. Well, and, it's the payoff that matters, right? See again, doing a lot of work to end up a multimillionaire with freedom and choices and you know a wonderful life—that's worth doing. Okay, working my ass off so I can go out and come back with venison and I don't even eat the shit. Right, that does not seem like a good trade. To that's me. right because because you haven't the hunting experiences you have had in the past are not the hunting experience that you would have with me and and what about goat like you eat the goat yeah absolutely and everything that you kill you eat everything so you've eaten bear i've eaten bear see what's bear taste like not great see so why ever go kill another bear i ha i ha actually i haven't killed a bear in a lot of years for that reason now when it comes to me like a steak a cow yep i'll eat the shit out of a cow yeah but like a cow tongue not eating his tongue yeah not eating his brain like you know i don't need like i just started getting into bison only because of the protein and the lean quality of it yeah the quality of it and it tastes like hamburger fortunately yeah bison meat is amazing now now think about isn't that a big ass buffalo huge how huge. What, what kind of, what size gun does it take to bring one of those down well the minimum caliber is like 300 so <sighs> it's uh it's a that you can use in the Yukon. That's legally the minimum caliber. How do sure. you get one of those out of there? Same thing. You generally speaking though, I shouldn't say like you're not packing it miles. Now I probably pack bison further than, you know, normal person, a normal hunter would ever even consider doing. Um, but why don't you get one of those quads that just, you yeah, no, slap I have, up? I have everything. We have all the, I have all the machinery, snow machines, you know, eight wheeled vehicles, ATVs, airplanes, like I have it all. Well, and if I, I ever come up, Greg, make sure that we bring them all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By um, the way, that's why I quit basketball. I, I want to get back to, I want to get back to the point of you had a bad experience. Yeah. And I think that if we went hunting together, the experience that, that you had it's not going to be easy physically it's not going to be easy um but that's the mental gains that you would come away from with the knowledge going into it that it's not going to be easy and you know doing difficult things in the natural environment and choosing to do so those things are so applicable to the real world here's i hunted last just this past fall with a buddy and we met uh, his son and my son are the same age, um, su very successful in uh, insurance. Uh, but he moved to the Yukon and has an insurance company. Great guy. Um, and we really, you know, connected on through hockey and business. And he had never been, he living in the Yukon for seven years and he had never been in the wilderness essentially. And you can do that. You can live in Whitehorse. We have all the amenities. Um, I took him out and we did a moose hunt this past fall and he came back from that experience 
And he literally walked into his house and he said to his wife and his mom, who was up there um, helping his wife take care of the kids while he was gone. He said, this past week has been the best week of my life with the exception of when I got married. So he found something that he's been in the business world, super successful. He found something in that wilderness experience that he can, nobody can ever take away. And it was life-changing. He said for the, you know, I walk down the street now and I see people and I go, Hmm, you don't even have a clue. Like you don't really know what's going on. And you know, he's just the best way I can describe it is like, he just, it's changed his life and he's just waiting for the next, you know, what's the next trip because he can take that difficult. Now for me, it's take that difficult experience for him. But for me, whether it's adventure racing or, you know, a 430 mile foot race in the middle of the winter that takes you eight days, it's that experience that when you can do difficult things and you do it in an outdoor environment and you take that to the real world, you take that back to the business world and you're unstoppable. Mm. Folks better pay attention. That's coming from an outdoorsman and an entrepreneur. You got successful businesses as well. So you take that, those same principles, you apply them to business and you can build a, a massive business. So, this past three years during COVID has been extremely challenging for a lot of companies, for a lot of different you know businesses. Some have made a lot of money. The experiences that I've gained through adventure racing, which is arguably the most difficult human endurance sport on the planet, and I'm not just going out and running you know 200 miles for the sake of running it and not, com but competing at the highest level and choosing to do so. That's like David Goggins shit. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Like David Goggins is is a beast, um, and he does do some you know ultra races uh, as well, right? And yeah, he's a he's a machine. There's there's no doubt about that. And he uh, he keeps he keeps at it. There's yeah, I have a lot of respect for and admiration for what he can uh, the mental strength that he has. Yeah. And we we were. You know, when you put, when you choose to do these things, when you choose to do a 430 mile race on solo foot? on foot in the Arctic and you have to pull your gear behind you and there's no one coming. Like I started that race and this is in February. It's dark, you know, 20 hours of the day and maybe not quite 20, maybe 18, somewhere around there. But it's darkness, temperatures got down to minus 50. And I started that race, and after the first, you know, 24 miles, I never saw another person on the whole race course. And I call it a race course. It's, you know, it's 430 miles, but it, it's a trail in the middle of the winter, that dog trail. And when you choose to do these kind of things, to and you experience and you have to survive on your own then the real world's easy i'm not saying that everyone should go and do a 430 mile race in the middle of the winter in the arctic what should, what are you saying i'm saying if you're doing nothing these are these are these are the three things that i believe if you take care of these these three things if you take number one it's your health I agree with that. Number one, it has to be your health. Because if you can't take care of you, how do you take care of the people around you that you love the most? 100%. Health, that's my number one. You, you better not say my number two. Well, I mean, that's that leads me to the people around you. All I care about is the people that are in my circle. Which are relationships. The, exactly. Your family. That's, that's my number your two. Your friends. Right? I swear to God, keep going. What's the third one? I bet you ours are different. Well, I mean, well, this is where... Like, and I, when I say the health for me, the outdoors and all of it come t together to make a healthy human being. And I think that there's not just physical, not just hitting the gym, um, but you know, your food, all of these Mind, things that come everything. together yeah. and, and spending time in the outdoors. So that's, so I feel like I've kind of taken care of that one there because the outdoors is so important to me. 
Um, and then the family and friends, the people and the extended family, like the people that when I give meat to, you know, the women, single moms, I don't know them all, but I mean, it's impacting other people's lives as well. And taking care of, taking care of the people that you can with the means that you've got. And what that leads to is you have to have the means to be able to do it. You have to have, be able to have the financial ability. So is the third one money? Well, finances. Yeah. See, we got the same three telling you. So health, I'll I'll show you video after video after video of me saying the same exact thing. I say health's the most important. Why? Because if you don't have that, you'll give up everything you have to get that back. Exactly. Then relationships, because if you listen to a bunch of people dying on their deathbed, they're not talking about their money or their businesses. They're talking about relationships. That's what they regret. That's what they're going to miss the most. That's what they want to do is spend time with the people and their loved ones. And then the last one is money. Why? Well, because money is very important. Most people don't put enough focus on it. So with that money, you get the best health care. So you can, you know, fine tune that you can also be, make a bigger impact with your family, you know, better health care, better education, better existences. So uh, in my opinion, you, you, I focus on, you know, health relationships and money. Now, somebody was, what about God? Well, that's a relationship, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's all in there. That's what I tell people. That's, it's funny that you say those because i would have swore your third one wouldn't have been money see i just say money what would you think that the other one would be i don't know i I was surprised when you said health but a lot of people realize health's pretty important so that didn't surprise me yeah yeah but then not many people say relationships are next because most people don't realize the relationships are literally where what it boils down to well without a without great relationships with the with people like it's pretty difficult to be happy like happiness isn't even, isn't even, it's almost unattainable Mm -hmm. without like we are, you know, human beings where we want to spend time with people. That's why like in my, you know, professional career, I've really raced like I've been on team sports and adventure racing is a team sport. So, and it's the ultimate team sport because you have to rely on the people. Brad, if you and I were racing together in an adventure race, and you're a great paddler. I'm a great runner. You and I get into a boat and you are going to do most of the heavy lifting because that's your, that's your thing. <clears throat> Three days into a race, you know, maybe, maybe I'm feeling really good and you're, and you're not. So now I'm the better paddler on the team that day. The next day, Brad, you're taking my backpack. Because like I'm having a low time, I'm sleeping, I haven't slept for, none of us have slept, we're sleeping an hour and a half a day. Is that what it takes? Yeah, we basically... Damn, dude, we're going to have to have you back just talk solely about that. Like, that's nuts. The first of any multi-sport or multi-day adventure race, generally speaking, the race starts, we don't sleep for 36 hours, we sleep for an hour and a half to two hours on the trail, like in a garbage bag like, or wherever, not trail, wherever you are, because it's all map and compass navigation. So like you're just cross country in the wilderness in, you know, I raced all over the world. So whether it's in the outback in Australia or the Mongolian mountains or, but it's 36 hours is generally speaking, we don't sleep. And then we sleep an hour and a half every day after that until you finish the race. And we don't finish the race unless both you and I finish together. So where I was going is day four. I'm, I'm a great generally, you know, say I'm a great runner. And on day four, I'm a mess. And you take my backpack and you hook me on toe, like literally a bungee strap going from, from your backpack around my waist. And you tow me because we don't finish the race until we all cross the line together. And that's why it's the ultimate team sport. And that's why when anything that I do, I surround myself, I try to surround myself with great individuals with high morals and team players. And when you're, and and that's just what I look for in, in people and if you're if you're a team player you're 
you can you can do so much more as a team than any individual. Another bomb. That's the truth. When you create an environment, which you have, when you create an environment where like-minded people are working toward a similar goal with the same intensity, it's, it's magical. And I've grown up and I've looked for those kind of relationships and those kind of people to surround myself with, you know, moving toward the same goal. And, and I think it came from these, you know, adventure racing and, and pushing myself in difficult, natural environments. And it's, it's, it's been a blast. Well, dude, it's like, uh, I almost, I'm almost envious, but not quite only because man, I know the kind of, let's just say, I don't want to say pain because it's kind of the, that bittersweet, but man, I'll tell you, there's a lot of work in what you do. I think when we stay comfortable, if you, if you seek comfort all the time, like what is the, what, what is the end goal? Like, I think we mm-hmm. have to challenge ourselves in order to get better. And you're well, always, true. you're always striving like anybody that's in your situation or mine or that like everyone wants to get better. Yeah. But just like, you know, getting beat up, you know, some people say, you know, go, get, get in the cage and do UFC for fun. No, I don't think it's fun getting my face punched. Now, yeah. do, w- would I get better at fighting if I did? Well, sure I would, but why do I need to be better at fighting? I have a gun, right? Yeah, fair, fair enough. Why do you? But yeah, like, I, like, dude, your muscles, your fist, your black belt—it it ain't gonna do shit against my nine millimeter, right? So I've got what I say is a degree in Ching Ching Pow. So what happens when you're traveling and you travel to a country like Canada? Like, this is the, the most extreme well, then example. You know what? I guess I stay it. out of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> or I get my ass kicked. It won't be the first time. Probably won't be the last. Come on. You don't want to stay out of Canada. No, it's, but, but my point is I'm not, I'm not going into a UFC cage yeah. to fight every day just in case sometime if I need to defend myself, I can because I've yeah. got a gun. So guess what? Nine times out of 10, the gun will defend me. Um, and if I, and if I get my ass kicked, you know, then, then that's once I'm not going to go intentionally do it every day of the week. I think just in case I don't get my ass kicked once in real life, I take one ass kicking over, over 900. Yeah. Fair enough. I think it's, it's about the challenge. What challenges you? What, what do you, what, what adversity do you seek that challenges you? Well, again, I do, I do understand and agree with you do have to, but the question is, is what? Everyone's different. You like yeah. to go up in the mountains and, you know, yeah. pack out thousand pound animals because it's challenging. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'll just go to the store and buy a steak. Now, what else, what else can I do? You know, let's see if I can flip this company. Let's see if I can get a thousand people to sign up for this deal. Yeah. Let's see, you know, I got different challenges, but, but you know, they're, they're still very challenging. Absolutely. And what if you took an experience like what, you know, say you came up with me. And it changed, you, you, you had the opportunity to look at the world a little differently. It provided a level of, of consciousness and. Well, are um, we doing ayahuasca up there? <laughs> no, but it, it provided you a level of, um, you know, this, I call mental domination. Just from hunting? Just from pushing yourself in an environment that is not, that is not comfortable and not known. Dude, now I really got to go watch your show. I got to see this. Is that what you're doing on the show? Yeah, it's it's like these long treks and these these things. It's is like, the show boring or is it is it popular? Because like if you're long trekking, there's nothing. You're not shooting and no. Killing. And that's that is that's one of the challenges that we've had, right? Because today, modern, you know, everybody is yeah, like, they want boom, boom, boom. We need to see this. Yeah, like dude, and you've like, been hiking for a day. Let's go kill yeah, something. Seven to like often. Our, and that's what's unique is that we try to, I try to portray the difficulty, but it's challenging for me to even portray that difficulty because I come from a background of adventure racing and there's well, start, not. Start bringing a city slicker with you, dude. Right. Aren't you the producer? Dude, you guys should factor that in. I'm serious. Like there would be a lot of people. Matter of fact, the bomb squad would volunteer. I'll bet you there's people on the bomb squad to be your first city slicker that'll that'll say okay fine i'll go with you and then film that 
film there saying, get me the hell out of here. Like, I'm serious, guys. I want to leave. You yeah. know, have a helicopter on standby. <laughs> you know, get them out of there if they really cry and bitch and moan. But, dude, yeah. that's what people will watch, a train wreck. Yeah. Well, and that's that. You're 100% right. You're 100% right. People want to see a train wreck. And that's, you know, you ask the question, is it popular? With hardcore hunters, it is popular. Well, sure. Yeah. And with people that know what's going on out there, sure, it's it's, it's, a hunting it's show. very popular. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, trying to get it the mass appeal where people are watching it even right. if they don't hunt. I'm gonna yeah. go watch it just to see what you do. You know, a Sportsman's Channel. Yeah, it's on YouTube as well. You can just YouTube Greg McHale's Wild Yukon, and you'll see. Yeah, you know, obviously a number of videos will come up, but um, yeah. Folks, Greg McHale spelled M C H A L E Wild Yukon. You know how to spell that. Appreciate you coming all the way down here to Las Vegas. Of course, I know you're here for the shot show. Yeah. But I appreciate uh, you coming on down here, and maybe I will go hunting with you one of these days. Who knows? Brad, man, I'd, uh, I'd be happy to have you. Thanks. I really appreciate you uh, You know, you taking the time to, to have me in. Sure, my pleasure, man. My pleasure, dude. I like to bring the knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. Who knows when we might get stuck out in the Yukon and need to know what the hell to do. You know what I'm saying? What about like, actually, I was going to get into that, but I'll, let's have you back for a second episode so we can talk more about the the adventure races. Sure. And then a little survival out, out in the wilderness. Because, you know, when it comes to, you know, what berries do you eat? What plants do you eat? You know, how do you know that shit? You got to get a book or something? Well, I mean, when you, when it starts, when you start to get into that, like you need to, yeah, you need to know what plants are obviously if you see berries you know you know everybody knows what a blueberry looks like right so there's 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 some basic things that uh that i think most people would know yeah um but yeah in the yukon for the most part you can almost eat eat any kind of berries for the most part but you need to know well folks if you don't have a book stick to the blue ones <laughs> or stay out of the yukon and until next time keep it real <laughs> Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.